must roll and never will I turn around. I've set my feet on God's road. I'm heading for the higher ground. The Lord is walking beside me. He gives me by his grace. And every step he will guide me. Till I see him face to face. I've set my face on God's road. And never will I turn around. for the higher ground. I've set my feet on God's road and never will I turn around. I've set my feet on God's road I'm heading for the higher ground. I've set my feet on God's road and never will I turn around. for me I've come too far to ever turn around again yes he's walking all the way beside me and my soul's found victory I've passed over onto higher ground brought me out of the barring just for me. I've come too far to ever turn around again. Yes, he's walking all the way beside me, and my soul's found victory. I've passed over onto higher ground. I was living in the land of where I never saw the light of day, thought I'd never be free again. God sent his only son to deliver me and to show me a better way. I passed over onto higher ground. He brought me out of the barren wilderness to a place that he chose for me. I've come too far to ever turn around again. Yes, he's walking all the way beside me and my soul's found victory. I've passed over onto higher ground.
Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for your people. Thank you for those who are coming for the first time. We pray, Lord, that you will reach every life with your word tonight in Jesus' name. We're asking for all our pastors, overseers, leaders, and workers. We pray, Lord, that this word will reach everyone too in Jesus' name. All our members will strengthen everyone. Like a real shepherd, you minister to the needs of your sheep in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to our Bible study tonight. As you have heard from the announcement, we are studying from the Gospel according to St. John. We started from chapter 1, now we are in chapter 10. And tonight we are looking at chapter 10 of John from verse 11 all through to verse 21. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hiring, a hired servant, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and fleeth the wolf, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hiring, the hired servant, flees because he is not is an hiring and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, one shepherd. Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, and I take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. Or read verses 19 to 21 later. As you look at the passage, and you've heard and you have read together with me, you see he's talking about the shepherd. And he says, I'm the good shepherd. And he tells us the characteristic about that good shepherd. He laid down his life for the sheep. And then he takes it up again. That's talking about his resurrection. Actually, as you look at the whole chapter, our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior is teaching and revealing the truth about the shepherd and the sheep. But this particular passage from verse 11 to verse 18 that we have read is talking about a supreme sacrifice. The shepherd's supreme sacrifice for the sheep. That's the title of the message tonight. The shepherd's supreme sacrifice for the sheep. And you see that in this chapter, the Lord had actually started from verse 1, talking about the shepherd. Then he talks about the other people that came pretending to be the shepherd, claiming to be the shepherd, and proclaiming themselves to be the shepherd. But Jesus said they were not true, and they were not faithful. He gave this as a parable. Look at verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them. But they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. I pray tonight you will understand. Because you see, even though Jesus Christ himself, the greatest of teachers, the teacher come from heaven, spoke to them directly, and he spoke to them about himself and about the shepherd, the shepherd who is the savior, the shepherd who gave his life, and the shepherd who came to save us from our sins. Yet 
they didn't understand. His immediate audience, his immediate hearers, they were actually familiar with the shepherding of flocks, flocks of sheep. And yet, they couldn't understand. People in that nation, the nation of Israel, had become lost sheep. And they were sinful. And was say that these lost sheep who have gone astray, he came to bring them, bring them back to the Father, bring them back to salvation, bring them back to the fold of God. They were weak. He came to strengthen them. They were deceived. He came to show them the right way. They were ignorant. He came to instruct them, inform them, and reveal the mind of the Father in heaven unto them. They had been misled, but now he wanted to gather them together. They were vulnerable. That means they were open to attack, open to destruction. In fact, it says they were lost. See what he had said about them. We're looking at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 36. In verse 36 it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, and they were scattered abroad, as, look at this, as sheep having no shepherd. There are many people that claimed they were shepherds, they claimed they were teachers, they claimed they were leaders, they, came, they, they, they claimed that they came to give instruction to the people. But actually they were not doing the work therefore they were like sheep without a shepherd look at chapter 10 in chapter 10 of matthew the lord's still talking about uh, these people he's sending out now the 12 disciples and he's sending them for so that he can preach to the people and bring the lost sheep back home he says but go rather matthew chapter 10 verse 6 go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were lost. Lost in the wilderness of sin. But now these apostles and these disciples were to go to them. And to preach the word of God to them. Look at verse 7. And as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But till the end of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They still couldn't understand. And they still couldn't come back to the Lord. And the Lord lamented over them, and the Lord wept over them. Luke chapter 19. We're reading from verse 42. Luke chapter 19, verse 42. Saying, if thou art known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. They were lost in darkness. They were lost in their superstition. They were lost in their religion. And Jesus Christ came as the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the glorious shepherd. And yet they couldn't understand. And they couldn't see that here is Jesus. Here is the Lord. And here is the one that has come to bring us back to the Father. It happened to them like we read in Job chapter 5. In Job chapter 5, reading from verse 14. Job chapter 5, verse 14. They meet with darkness in daytime, and they grope in noonday, in the noonday as in the night. But he saveth the poor from the sword, and from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. Those Pharisees they didn't help situation at all. They gathered in their synagogues, they gathered in their temples, and the people gathered together wanting to see the light of day, wanting to see the light of the gospel. But they were grouping in darkness. Jeremiah tells us, even long time before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, what had become of the children of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 50, I'm reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 50, I was looking at verse 6. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 6, it says, my people, the people of Israel, it says, my people, those who came out of Egypt and they came through the wilderness and now they're in the land of Canaan, see what happened to them. My people has been lost sheep. My people have been lost sheep. They were in the wilderness and they've gone astray. 
And yet Jesus now came so that he could recover them, bring them back as the shepherd of the sheep. But my people have been lost sheep. How did they become lost? Lost in sin, lost in evil, lost in wickedness. Look at what follows there. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They are shepherds who are to show them the way. They cause them to go astray. They are shepherds who are to go before them and lead them into pasture and lead them into the good revelation of the word of God. They cause them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. Listen to this. They have forgotten their resting place. They have forgotten how to get to heaven. They have forgotten how to get to their resting place. That's why when Jesus came, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All these children of Israel had forgotten all that. Now Christ came, and as he came, he came as Savior, yes, he came as shepherd, so that we now can return to him. And I pray that if you are still in the jungle wilderness of sin today, is the day you return in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 25. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 25. It says, For ye were a sheep going astray. Ye were a sheep going astray. Those people went to their synagogue. Many of us will go to our churches. Those people went to their temple. Many of us go to our conferences. Those people, they said they were serving the Lord, but they are going astray until Christ came and he began to call them one by one into the fold. He says, but ye were sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the, tell me, the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Our souls that went astray. Our souls that were famished. Now the Lord is bringing us back. And as he brings us back, he brings us to his supreme sacrifice. Because he died for us to take away our sins. That's why we're talking about this tonight. The shepherd's supreme sacrifice for the sheep. You see, as we have read, those leaders of Israel, the high priests and the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes and the teachers who were supposed to be shepherds over the people. What did they become? They became deceivers. They became false prophets. They became enemies of the Savior. Enemies of salvation. Enemies of righteousness. And they were blind leaders. They were thieves and robbers. And then the Lord Jesus said they had become Hirely sacrificing the sheep to keep their position. We're coming back to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 11. As he spoke about himself as a good shepherd, then he spoke about these people, the pretenders. He spoke about these people, those leaders, blind leaders, who are leading the children of Israel astray. Look at chapter 10, verse 11 again. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling is not talking about those Pharisees. Instead of getting people into the kingdom, they were casting away people that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose sheep and whose sheep, who, who so own the sheep and not, they see the wolf coming and they leave the sheep and they flee. The wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. He has spoken about these people even from verse 1. Look at chapter 10 verse 1. Verily, verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. He spoke about them in verse 5. He says, a stranger will they not follow. That is, the sheep will not follow these strangers, these pretenders, and these false prophets and these false teachers. A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of 
the stranger of strangers. Look at verse 10, part 1. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. That's all they came to do. Those who are pretenders, and they just wanted to keep their position, they wanted to keep their place in the synagogue, they wanted to keep their authority, and then they wasted the lives of those people. And many of them died without having salvation because those leaders did not allow them to have the knowledge of the truth and then to have the freedom to make a choice of their own lives. They were selfish, they were wicked, they were depraved, they were sinful, they were hardened, they were blind, they were deaf, and they were desperate shepherds who stole the hearts of the people to their destruction. They stole the hearts of the people, the souls of the people to their destruction. But thank God, Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our shepherd. And Jesus is our Lord. And he will rescue every one of us from those uh, devouring uh, thieves and robbers of religion in Jesus' name. Tonight we're looking at this passage under three subtitles. Number one, the scattering of the sheep under hired strangers. The scattering of the sheep under hired strangers. Already I've read to you from verse 5, the Lord Jesus referred to them as strangers. And that the real sheep, the true sheep, will not listen to them. Not only that, there were hirelings, there were hired hands, hired stewards, hired servants, there were hired people, and there were hired strangers. Point number two, that is the sacrifice of the shepherd for helpless sheep. Sheep, helpless, sheep, apparently and seemingly hopeless, they couldn't help themselves, they have been lost. But now Jesus Christ made the supreme sacrifice, the sacrifice of the shepherd for helpless sheep. Point number three, the schism, that means division, the schism and the slander among hypocritical scoffers. The schism and the slander among hypocritical scoffers. Scoffers. We're coming to number one. Tell me your number one there. The scattering of the sheep on the hired strangers. Let's come back to chapter 10. We need to understand this so that it is not everybody that carries the Bible. You say, well, they were studying, they're carrying the Bible, and now you run after them. It's not everybody saying that I'm a prophet, I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I'm a shepherd, I'm a bishop, and you carry your Bible around and after them. It's not everybody that opens the door of a particular hall, and they call it an assembly, and call it fellowship hall, and they call it whatever name, a good name, and yet they do not know the way, the way that leads to heaven, the way that leads to the Savior, and the way that leads to holiness and righteousness of life. That's what Jesus Christ said, and he warned us about these who are strangers to the grace of God. Look at this. I'm reading from chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, but he that is an hireling, hired stranger, and not the, sh not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, they're just there as uh, workers, they are there, not like our own workers who are interested in the work of the Lord, but they are there to just, just serve their pay. And it says, they see the wolf coming, they leave the sheep and they flee. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. And the Lord Jesus Christ explain, what did they run when they saw danger? What did they flee when they saw difficulty? What see they couldn't stay? Why couldn't stay? Why they couldn't they stay to protect the sheep and to preserve the lives of the sheep? It says in verse 13, the hireling flees because he's an hireling, a hired stranger, and cares not for the sheep. The hireling in the language of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the business of religion. It's there for money. 
the hireling there is there for material gain. The hireling, the hired, the hired stranger is there for personal profit. Is there for the position of honor. That hiding that the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about, these Pharisees and Sadducees, they were there for popularity. They are there for political advancement. And the Lord Jesus Christ had referred to them. I'm going to read that again in John chapter 10. I'm going to read from verse 5. It says, And a stranger will be not follow. He had referred to them as strangers and will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. These were hired strangers. What does that mean, stranger? It means that they were stranger. They were strangers to their heart of the shepherd. Do you need to have the heart of the shepherd? The mind of the shepherd? The love of the shepherd? The desire of the shepherd? To see that the sheep are preserved. Number one, they were strangers to the heart of the shepherd. Number two, they were strangers to the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He made of himself of no reputation. All that these people wanted, they wanted popularity and reputation. And they were strangers to the mind of Christ. Number three, these people were strangers to the value of his soul. The value of his soul. They didn't understand the worth of his soul. The salvation of his soul. The importance of these sheep having real salvation. Here was the Savior. Here were the sheep to link them together so that the sheep will have salvation. But no, these hired servants were strangers to the value of his soul. Not only that, number four, they were strangers to the love of God for the sinner. They were strangers for the love of God for the sinner. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. These people didn't know about that love. That God the Almighty paid such a great price so that souls will be born again. They didn't have any of that. Number five, they were strangers of the demand of holiness for heaven. Higher lives. I had slaves, I had servants, I had strangers. They were strangers to the demand of God that without holiness no man will see the Lord. They manifested anger, they manifested envy, they manifested jealousy, they manifested slander, they manifested quite a lot of this because they were strangers to the demand of God on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The hireling was just for hire. And if this uh, sheepfold, if the sheepfold scatters, they go to another sheepfold and look for employment so that they can be employed another place. See how the Bible talks about them. I'm reading from Micah chapter 3. Micah chapter 3. That these were hirelings. These were not people interested in the salvation of souls, interested in uh, the holiness of souls, interested in the things of the Lord at all. Well, we're coming to Micah chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 11. Look at this. The heads thereof judge for a word. When he says the heads thereof, the heads of denominations in our day, and the heads of churches in our day, and the heads of ministries in our day, and the heads of religious, uh, religious congregations. He says the heads thereof judge for a word, the priests thereof teach for hire. The, the, the priests thereof, they teach for salary. And as you look at the religious world today, that's what you find. Uh, uh, what can I get out of this? How much money can I get out of this? How much uh, benefit can I get out of this? Because it says the priests teach for hire. Those are the hirelings. And the prophets thereof divine for money. The prophets thereof, they'll prophesy, they pray for people, and they jump from here to there. And it is how much money can they get out of the offering prayer for people? Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, It's not uh, the Lord among us, and none evil can come upon us. It says, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house of the as the high places of the forest. 
Uh, you, you see, it's not only at this time now people are walking, doing religion for hire, and they're having, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, this great event for hire, and for money, for what they can get out of it. It's been for a long time we're looking at Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6, you'll find there's some people here. You know, there are people that prophesy. And then you'll wonder, are they giving that kind of prophecy to be good for everybody? And, then, you know, next, uh, next month, uh, everything is going to turn around. Economy will turn around. This one will turn around. Why are they prophesying like that? They want to say what people want to hear because they are looking for something, personal gain, personal profit, and personal promotion. Nehemiah chapter 6, I'm reading there from verse 10. It says in verse 10 afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Metamehatabiel. And he says, who was shut up? And he said, let us meet together in the house of God, house of God, house of God. That's where they want to be all the time. And that's where they do their business all the time. Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. And let us shut the doors of the temple. For they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. And I said, shall such a man as I flee. Who is there that being as I am will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. But look at this, look at this, verse 12. For, and lo, I perceived that God has not sent him, but that he, profess, he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sambalat had, tell me, hired him. They gave him salary, they gave him money. They said, you know, Nehemiah is up and doing. Nehemiah is building the wall. Nehemiah is going to protect the people of God. Nehemiah is like a shepherd. He wants to gather them into the sheepfold, weaken his son, discourage him, destroy him, and tell him to go and hide somewhere. Tell him there is danger. Tell him there is insecurity. Tell him that, you know, if you come over here, they will kill you. If you go over there, they will kill you. If, if you go on building that wall, they will kill you. Therefore, come in here and they protect your Said Nehemiah said they hired him, they hired him, they gave him money so that he'll come and say that. Look at verse 13. Therefore, he was hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. If you're doing something good for God, I pray that those hired strangers they will not stop you. I said they will not stop you. You know, all the slander and the gossip and the, you know, the current kind of talk, you know, it is not the time to do evangelism. It is not the time to go about seeking for souls. It is not the time for, you know, you men and women and you go to that street and go to that street and touch that one and touch that one and you say, come to the Lord. Those people, they are evil. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of this? They are hired by Satan and those hired uh, strangers, they will not affect you. They will not affect your conviction. They will not affect your courage. And you keep on doing what you ought to do for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Look at this. We're looking at Job chapter 7 verse 2. Job chapter 7. I'm reading here from verse 2. As a servant earnestly desires the shadow. And as an hireling looking for the reward of his work. He's talking about people here. All they're looking for, they're looking for, when are they going to pay us now? We well, thank God for our church here. Say, we well, thank, well, thank God for our church. I can't hear our people. You know, in some other places, if they do any little thing, the pastor must, you know, pay them something. If they do anything, the pastor must, you know, give them something. That's an award here, another award here, another award here. Yeah, maybe it's a car, maybe it's this, and maybe it's this. That's how they do the work. But, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of workers here, you just come, you spend your time, you spend your money. You are not an hireling. I said you are not an hireling. And God will reward your work wonderfully in Jesus' name. But you see, this people, they're so much in a hurry. In a hurry, when are we going to get this? And when are we going to get that? They distributed rewards and awards uh, last year. When are they going to do it for this year? The year is running out. But thank God here, our reward is in heaven. 
and our reward will come from the Lord Almighty himself in Jesus' name. And the joy of service, that will be the strength of your life in Jesus' name. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 56, look at the higher list here. Isaiah chapter 56, I'm reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 56, we're reading from verse 10, is watchmen are blind. It's talking about these people who say they are watchmen over the people. They are watching over their souls. They are watching over their interests. And they are watching over their spiritual lives. And it says, it's watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are dumb dogs that they cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. It says, ye, they are greedy dogs that cannot have enough. They are greedy dogs that cannot have enough. That means they are for hire. And they, you know what they have given us not enough. Give us more, give us more. And it says they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his gain from his quarter. They are looking for gain. I pray that your, your service will not be like that. Your service will not just be for people, but your heart will be there. Your mind will be there. Evangelism, your heart is there. Soul winning, your heart is there. House fellowship, your heart is there. Serving the Lord, singing to the glory of God, your heart is there. And all the other things we're doing in the household of faith, I pray that as you put your heart there, you'll not be like these hirelings in Jesus' name. In Ezekiel chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 27. Ezekiel chapter 22 and we're reading from verse 27 it says her princes in the midst of her are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain you see that they'll destroy souls to get dishonest gain there are people that they do not know the value of souls they're strangers to the kingdom of god they're strangers to calvary they're strangers to the reason why jesus christ died for the sinner and what they will do they will do anything so that the people ought to get saved and the people ought to repent the people ought to return from their backsliding they will not return so that they'll have their own gain. look at that part again the second part of verse 27 it says to destroy souls to gauge dishonest gain look at verse 28 a prophet subdued them with untempered mortar seeing vanity and divining lies unto them saying thus says the lord god when the lord has not spoken thus says the lord god when the lord has not spoken the thing the lord has spoken the word of god the things the lord has spoken the word of salvation the word of righteousness all that they close that up and then they begin to say other things what the lord has not said and it is just to destroy souls they will not catch you they will not destroy your soul we're looking at Sephaniah. Sephaniah. I hope you know where Sephaniah is. Go on opening the Old Testament to Osea to Amos. And then you are coming near the end of the Old Testament. And then you are going to come to Sephaniah. Sephaniah chapter 1. Sephaniah chapter 1. And here we're reading from verse 1. Chapter 3 rather. Sephaniah chapter 3. Sephaniah chapter. Tell me chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 1 look at this they say woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressive city she obeyed not the voice she received not correction she trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Look at that. As you look at that, they don't have any connection with the Lord. They don't have any relationship with the Lord. It says her princes within her are running lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They know not the bone till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests, have pol they have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. They have done violence to the law. They take the word of God. They remove it from the root. They do violence to the word of God. They tear the word of God apart. And they misinterpret the word of God just to have their own way and to have their own gain. Look at verse 5. The just Lord 
is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. The unjust knoweth no shame. That's why Jesus Christ always warned. You see, there are people that will say, I, I will just preach what I want to preach. I will preach the truth. I don't want to concern myself about, uh, you know, what other people are doing. Let them do what they're doing, and then I will do what I'm doing. I don't want to oppose anybody. I don't want to criticize anybody. No, you are not criticizing anybody. You are not opposing anybody. You're just reading the words of Jesus Christ, because Jesus said there are strangers. He said, there are higher lives. If you're going to be faithful to the word of God, you have to read the whole of the word of God and interpret the word of God very well. You're not looking at the faces of those higher lives. You're not looking at the faces of those uh, strangers. You interpret the word of God so that they'll come under conviction and they'll turn away from their evil. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets. That's your Lord and Savior. If you cannot say what your Lord and Savior has said, you are not standing for the truth. And you are not courageous enough to say, you don't have any backbone. If you have backbone, you'll say what Jesus Christ has said. He says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? of figs, of thistles, even so, every good tree bringeth forth a good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can corrupt tree bring forth a good fruit. And every tree, every tree, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and cast, tell me, into the fire. And he says, wherefore by their fruits he shall know them. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Look at, look at one of them. A hireling. Look at one of them. He wanted to get into the ministry so that he would have, you know, as much money he could have by selling religion. Selling religion. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 8 verse 19. Saying, give me also this power. That on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But you know, he wanted to corrupt the apostles themselves. Look at verse, uh, the previous verse in verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Can you sell this one to me? I'll give you money. Can you give me this power so that everywhere I go, I'll be able to do what you're doing also. And then I'll collect, of course, all the money I paid for it, I'm going to collect it back from the people when I start ministering to them. Look at verse 20. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Can you say that? Can you say that aloud? You see, when you have the grace of God in your life, and then you have the calling of God in your life, and there's somebody that is coming and saying, well, I'll give you money, whatever, name it, and I'll give you. So that if I have the same thing, I too, I will go here, but they're not for the salvation of souls. They're not for uh, the gathering souls into the kingdom. Here, Peter, the apostle said, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. I pray the Lord will deliver us from such people in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 16. Uh, we're reading from verse 18. Higher lives. Higher strangers. Strangers to the grace of God. Strangers to the value of the soul. Strangers to the mind of Christ. And strangers to the love of the shepherd. Strangers to the plan of God for the kingdom of God. These strangers, look at them uh, in Romans chapter 16 verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are there for money, you are not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are there for promotion, for position, you are not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They that are sought, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. They will not catch you. 
Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 21. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 21. Uh, they are all over the place in our country. They are all over the place in Africa, all over the place, all over the world. That they're doing religion for money, doing religion for what they can gain. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 21, For all seek their own, and not the things which are Jesus Christ. All seek their own exaltation. All seek their own position. All seek their own power. All seek their own influence. All seek their own money. All seek their own. And they are not seeking the things who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's uh, how they make a religion to become a, like a trading. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. And through covetousness shall they within words make merchandise of you. They turn the church to a market. They make merchandise of you. They turn religion to buying and selling. They turn religion to something for economy. And it says they'll make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I pray you'll not be damned with them. I pray you will be condemned with them. That means you will come out of them and you will not be unequally yoked together with those some believers. You will not stay with them. You will not abide with them. We'll come to point number two. We're looking at uh, John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I read from verse 11 and then we go to verse 14. It says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down, lays, uh, giveth his life for the sheep. That's uh, the Lord Jesus Christ talking about himself. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the reason you know he's the good shepherd is that he's not asking for anything. He's not asking for the sheep to be sacrificed for him. He's laying down his life for the sheep. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. And I'm known of mine. He's saying I'm the good shepherd. I'll sacrifice, supreme sacrifice. I'll shed my blood. Supreme sacrifice is going to give so that the sheep can be saved. So that the people who are lost, they're lost in sin, they're lost in darkness, so that they can be saved. Look at verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. He says we have this intimate relationship. And this very clear, transparent uh, intimacy between the Father and the Son. And he says, I laid down my life for the sheep. You see how he said that over and over. He's going to lay down his life. He's not afraid of dying for the sheep. He's not afraid of sacrificing for the sheep. He's not afraid of shedding his blood for the sheep. He's not afraid to give himself so that the people will have salvation. So that there will be forgiveness for them. So that there will be redemption for them. So that the grace of God, redemption of the Lord, will come to these people as a result of the sacrifice. And the supreme sacrifice is going to give. But look at verse 16. And all the sheep I have. Have. He's talking about the Gentiles because his disciples at that time, they were all Jews. Peter, James, John, and all those people, they were Jews. But he said, I'm going to reach out to the Gentiles too. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. That time, you know, we had not been born again then, but he had us in mind. He had you in mind. Say, he had me in mind. And he said, you are going to be saved and thank God you are saved. If you are not born again yet and you are here tonight, that's why he brought you. You didn't come here by accident. He brought you because he had you in mind. And he says, that they are not, you are not of this world yet. Them I must bring. And they shall hear my voice as he brings you, as he has brought us. You will hear his voice in Jesus' name. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. One fold and one shepherd. And then he tells us now the attitude of the father to that sacrifice. And he says, therefore, does my father love me? Because I laid down my life and that I might take it again. He's talking about his death on the cross of Calvary. And then his resurrection. 
He says in verse, uh, in verse 18, No man take it heed from me. If he didn't want to die, he wouldn't have died. Because he said, I could call 12 legions of angels from heaven if he needed a kind of protection or bodyguard. And those people, they couldn't have been able to arrest him. You know when they came uh, and they said, We're looking for Jesus. He said, Who are you looking for? They said, We're looking for Jesus. He said, If you're looking for Jesus, I am he. Let these people go. They fell on the ground. They got up again and they said, But I told you, I am Jesus. He had the power. He had the authority. He could have destroyed all of them. Then he took his life. He laid down his life for you and for me because of his love. He loves you. I said, He loves you. I can't hear our people. I said, He loves you. That's why he said, No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down of myself. And he says, I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. That's the resurrection. This commandment I have received of my father. As you think about Jesus Christ, something is very clear. Number one, he is the shepherd. He said, I'm good, the good shepherd. And this shepherd talked about laying out his life. Number one, he is the sacrifice. The sacrifice. The sacrifice. He's going to sacrifice his life. He's going to shed his blood. He's going to die for you, for me, for everyone. Number two, is the substitute. The soul that sinners, it shall die. And because you have seen, all have seen and come short of the glory of God, you should have died. But now he became the substitute. Your substitute, he died your death. That's why he laid down his life for you. Number three, the Savior. The Savior. That's why he laid down his life so that you can be saved. So that after that death, after that sacrifice, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He became your sanctifier your sanctifier you know we have the adamic nature and because of that adamic nature that's why adam and eve were driven out of the garden of eden and if we're going to go back to that garden if we're going to get to paradise if we're going to get to heaven that adamic nature sinful nature inbred nature corrupt nature must be taken away and jesus christ laid down his life so that that will happen he became our sin bearer our sin bearer all the bondage of our sin all the punishment of our sin all the penalty of our sin that's what he bore. actually he became the passover the passover because god said when i see the blood the blood of the lamb i will pass over you and because jesus christ has now shed his blood and he shed the blood for you when the lord sees that blood upon the little of your heart judgment will pass over you calamity will pass over you eternal punishment penalty will pass over you it became a propitiation propitiation that means uh, the sacrifice that appealed to the father that appealed to god and said upon their punishment and their propitiation and they will not die again he became our ransom our ransom that is uh, he gave himself so that the wrath of God will not come upon us anymore. He's become a redeemer. He's become a mediator. Is the atonement for the sheep. The atonement for the sheep. That's why he said he laid down his life. And he laid down his life for everyone. Everyone. And there's no exception. You are there tonight. You understand? Jesus laid down his life for you. Because he laid down his life for everyone in that generation at that time. He laid down his life for every generation until this generation. And now you can come to the Lord. And as you come to the Lord, he will take all your sins away. He'll take all your evil away. And all the penalty of uh, sin, all the penalty for your sin, everything it will take away in Jesus' name. And let's look at how he said it in Matthew chapter 20. We're looking at verse 28. Matthew chapter 20, and we're reading from verse 28. It's the ransom, and it's the one who has shed his blood so that we can be saved. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, even as the Son of Man, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life a ransom for many. 
And thank God I'm part of those many people. I said I'm part of those many people. Uh, and uh, you, you look at First Corinthians chapter five. First Corinthians chapter five, uh, and I'm reading from verse seven. First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. Put out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For Christ, even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. You see, that's why we say the supreme sacrifice. Even Christ, our, pa our sacrifice, Christ, our Passover. Is sacrifice for us. Is uh, giving the sacrifice. Is done what needs to be done so that all your sins will be forgiven and forgotten, and there will be no sin counted against you anymore. Because Jesus, the Savior, is your Savior as well as Shepherd. We're coming to First Peter chapter two, verse twenty-four. First Peter chapter two, verse twenty-four. Who is so self? Bear our sins in his own body on the tree. You see that? Think about all your sins, everything you ever did, and collect everything together, bundle everything together, and bring before the Lord Jesus Christ, and then remind him, if you have not done that, that his own self bear all your sins in his own body on the tree, that we've been dead to sins, you are dead to those sins now, those sins will not have dominion over you should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. He took your sin away, he took your sickness away, he took your curse away, and he took every walk of the devil away from your life. You will not bear them anymore in Jesus' name. How many people did Jesus die for? Look at this. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 3. It says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. In the sight of God our Savior. Thank God salvation is available. I said salvation is available. Look at verse 4. Who will have how many people to be saved? All men to be saved. Can you read that again? Who will have how many people? Can your brother be saved? Can your sister be saved? Can mommy, daddy be saved? Can all your children be saved? Jesus died for them. Jesus died for them. All your neighbors, Jesus died for them who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. What's his name? The man Christ Jesus. Look at this. Who gave himself a ransom, a ransom, a ransom. If anybody even is as bad as Saul of Tarsus, God can save him. Anybody as bad as the worst person you ever knew in your life, in your community, God can save them. Tell them, tell them, Jesus Christ has died for them. He is the good shepherd and is the lamp of God that takes the seas of the world away, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in good time. We are looking at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I will read him from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's why Jesus Christ had to die. That's why he had to shed his blood. Because uh, any, any other sin uh, you come to give to God, that cannot atone for sin. Only the blood and the blood of the Lamb, the spotless Lamb, the sinless Lamb. And the blameless lamb. It says almost all things about the Lord purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. That same uh, chapter 9, look at verse 25. It says, not, not yet, that he should uh, offer himself often. As the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others animals but it says for then must see often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world as see appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself it was necessary he had to die 
if God was going to overlook our sins, forgive our sins, and take away all the penalty of our sin, it was necessary that Jesus Christ had to lay down his life. That's why it says to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It's coming again. I said it's coming again. And when he comes again, all those who have been redeemed, all those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb will go with him in Jesus' name. Uh, you notice in that John chapter 10, he said over and over and over, I give myself. I give myself. I give myself. What did he give himself? What was he to do? What was the giving of himself to do? In your life, in my life, and in the life of every sheep. We're coming to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 4. He gave himself. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins. You see that? You see that? It's done it already. Everything that needs to be done for your salvation has been done. All you need to do now, turn away from those sins and then come to the Lord who gave himself our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world. Every evil in the world, he will deliver you. It's done already. It's done already. He has paid the, he has paid the price already. Any kind of evil coming from the depths or coming from the sky, coming from the forest, coming from the sea, coming from anywhere, Thank God you are delivered. According to the will of God, our Father. Look at chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This Christ will live in you. And you know, light and darkness cannot be in the same heart. If Christ is there, Satan will not be there. Satan will not be inside you. Evil spirit will not be inside you. Evil power will not be inside you. And all those people that say they are sending something to somebody, it will not get to you in Jesus' name. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, look at this, and gave himself for me. He loved me and he gave himself for me. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 2. It says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Christ loves you. And has given himself, you see this, and has given himself and offer for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Why did he give himself? Number one, for salvation. What did he give himself? Number two, for sanctification. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for the church, for it. Why? That she might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. If you are part of his church and then you are not sanctified, you are not even praying for sanctification, you are not interested in sanctification, you are overlooking, you are abandoning, you are rejecting the reason why Jesus gave himself for the church. Look at his suffering, look at his sorrow, look at his agony, look at the blood he shed. And he said, he gave himself for the church so that he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He has done that for you, for me. We are going to reap the benefit of that sanctification in Jesus' name. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We are reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2. And we are reading from verse 14. Who gave himself for us. You see that? It's reminding us that Jesus Christ has paid the supreme sacrifice. He has given himself for us. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how much of iniquity? 
all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You know, some people said, I don't know why, but I cannot be zealous. I don't know why. I cannot be up and doing. I don't know why. I cannot be on fire for the Lord. I don't know why. I feel cold. I feel lethargic. I feel I'm dragging. Get back to Calvary and realize that Jesus gave himself for you. That he might take all the iniquity away from you and purify you and make you zealous. And that zeal will start and come even from tonight in Jesus' name. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, he gave himself, he gave himself. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till the enemies be made, is put to. For by one offering, by that single offering on the cross of Calvary, that provided uh, salvation, and provided healing, and provided deliverance, and provided redemption, it also provided sanctification for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified whereof the holy ghost also is a witness for us for after that he had said before this is the covenant that I will make with, the, with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their mind will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. On the basis of what Christ has done. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 20 and verse 21. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead. He said, I, I have power to lay down my life. I have power to take it up again. And he says now, he brought him again from the dead. And Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. Who is Jesus Christ? That great shepherd of the sheep. I said it was Jesus Christ. That great shepherd of the sheep. I said it was Jesus Christ. That great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Make you. Give me the word there. Make you perfect. He will do it. Make you perfect in every good work. To do his will. Walking in you. That which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The price has been paid. Jesus Christ has died. Number one, to bear the penalty of our sins. Number two, to give salvation and eternal life to everyone that repents and believes. And number three, to make us righteous and give us a new life in Christ. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. Number four, to heal us of all our sicknesses. Not only that, to keep us healthy and if there's any sickness there the stripes of Jesus tonight will take it away in Jesus name number five to deliver us from the present evil world every evil in the world every evil in a community deliverance has come because Jesus Christ paid the penalty so that you'll be totally delivered number six to destroy all the works of the devil. Any work of the devil, every work of the devil, he will destroy everything in Jesus' name. In your family, he will destroy the works of the devil. In your personal life, he will destroy the works of the devil. In your business, he will destroy the works of the devil. And in your progress in life, in your ministry, is going to destroy all the works of the devil in Jesus' name. Number seven is to sanctify us and to make us holy. He laid down his life so that it will sanctify us and it will make us holy. Number eight is to restore all that were lost through Adam. It is to restore everything that were lost in Adam. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is a sanctifier. Jesus is our shepherd. And it will be for you in reality in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Let's look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 19. John chapter 10. And we're reading here from 
verse 19. Here he tells us in verse 19, all through to verse 21, and there was a division. Therefore, again, among the Jews, for these sins, what are they divided about? For these sins, what were the sins? Those who come over the wall and those who are not coming through the door, they're thieves and robbers. There's division among them because of that. Everybody knows that, that if you're not coming through the door, if you come by some other way, you're a thief and you're a robber. And it says, because of these sins, there is, a, you know, there's division between them. And Jesus kind of said, the hireling runneth, he flees away because it's not the owner of the sheep. What were they divided about? That's the very truth that the hired, the hired singer is not going to stay there and waste his life because of the sheep that do not belong to him. He had told them the truth. And then he said, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And it says they were divided. Look at that verse 19 again. There was a division therefore again among the Jews for these says and many of them said he has a devil and is mad why hear ye him he has a devil and is mad why hear ye him this was corners this was coffers this was sinners and this was blasphemous people and then thank God there were some other people there intelligent people you'll be an intelligent person sincere people you'll be a sincere person forthright people and truthful people and people that you know, they won't allow that kind to of pass on them others said in verse 21 these are not the words of him that has a devil can the devil open the eyes of the blind you didn't answer the devil cannot open the eyes of the blind you see many of them all those things they said they said that through envy when you are envious, you say negative things that are unreasonable. They send that through tradition because of their tradition. And Jesus Christ was not going through their tradition and did not give a rubber stamp of approval to their tradition. That's why he said he doesn't agree with us. He doesn't say what we say. And because of that, he has a devil and is mad. And because of their religion, religion without righteousness, religion without salvation, religion without holiness, religion without heaven, religion religion that does not separate them from Satan, religion that does not separate them from wickedness, because of their religion, that's why they said what they said, actually they were angry, and it is in anger they said what they said, their hearts were hard because of their hardness of heart, that's why they said what they said, look at these people, they call themselves shepherds, they have become wolves. These were people who were to protect uh, the lost sheep, but they had become like hardened goats. They turned religion to business. They turned religion to rebellion. Instead of repenting and becoming believers, they rebelled and became blasphemers. How blasphemous they were. What they said, he has a devil and is mad. Why are you listening to him? Because they were not going to hear his word. Because you are not part of his sheep. And because they will not believe on him, they felt no other person should believe on him. They were losers. They were the losers. All those people, none of them, because they didn't repent, none of them is in heaven. But thank God, Jesus is now in heaven. I said, Jesus is now in heaven. But those uh, blind leaders, they are in hell. And Jesus and his disciples, Peter, James, John, and the people that followed, and they said, we accept him, we receive him, we believe him, he is our savior. We believe him, he is our sanctifier. We believe him, he is our shepherd. They are now in heaven. While these blasphemous people, they are in hell, and they will be there forever and ever. And you will not follow them in Jesus' name. Look at this. The heavenly father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The person that God the father testified about, they said, He has a devil and is mad. And the person that the angel said, A savior is born this day in the city of David. And then is peace for everyone all over the world. Angels called him savior. They said, He has a devil. The psalmist said, It's my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The one 
one that the shepherd called, the, the David, David called a shepherd. They said, he is a, a devil and the one the spirit of God called the sanctifier. He said, it's a sanctifier. The spirit of God that recorded that through those uh, apostles in the word of God, God called him son and the uh, angels called him savior. The psalmist called him shepherd and the spirit called him sanctifier and they called him by another sinner. They were the people that are the devil. I said they were the people that are the devil. And now they have followed the devil to hell where the devil will be cast forever and ever. And I pray that that kind of a mind will not be in any of us in Jesus' name. Actually, this is what they always say. Whenever they didn't agree with anything, that's what they will say. Whenever anything was, uh, you know, kind of hitching them, I will not agree with their ideologies and tradition. That's what they will normally say. Look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 14. And many of the people therefore, when they had this uh, saying, said of the truth, this is the prophet. Others said, they said the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? And it says, and have not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the tower of Bethlehem where David came, where David was. So there was a division, schism. There was a division, separation. There was a division among the people because of him. A division within them because of him. But these people were just coffers and they didn't have eternal life because they had not believed on the Lord. That's why Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1, reading from verse 22. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22 is one in us actually. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22, how long is simple once where you lost simplicity. And the scorners, the scoffers, the light in their scorning and scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproach. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refuse, Pharisees. Because I have called and ye refuse, Sadducees. Because I have called and ye refuse, those of you are afraid they will cast you out of their temple. Because I have called and ye refuse, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel. And with none of my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a wild wind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me. But tell me. I will not answer. If you reject the truth, if you reject the, the Son of God, if you reject the Savior, if you reject the Shepherd, it says because of that rejection, because of that blasphemy, and because of a stay with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it says, then shall they call upon me, and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despise all my reproof. Therefore, therefore, because of that, shall they eat the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso, whoso hackneth unto me shall dwell safely. I will hack him. I will listen. I will believe. Whoso hackneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Actually, the Old Testament talked, spoke about Jesus Christ that was coming. And he will be the one to give that final sacrifice. Look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And I'm reading here from verse 4. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And these Pharisees said, they knew the Old Testament, they studied the Old Testament, they believed the Old Testament, they accepted the Old Testament, and yet, when Jesus Christ came to fulfill that Old Testament scriptures, they didn't accept, they didn't believe, they didn't receive, it says, but he was wounded for transgressions. 
He was bruised for iniquities, and the chastisement of peace was upon him. He says, for, and with his stripes, tell me, we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all souls. He was oppressed and was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off from the out of the land of the living and for the transgression of my people was he stricken for the transgression of my people was he stricken who is that talking about i said who is that talking about Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, you see what uh, the Spirit of God has left us as to who that is talking in, uh, about. It tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, and we're reading from the start to the place of the scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. That's what we're in Asa just now. Like a, like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So he opened, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, of some other man. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him and preach unto him who have you been hearing about tonight i said who have you been hearing about tonight jesus is your savior jesus is your final sacrifice jesus is your sin bearer jesus is your savior and jesus is your sanctifier and jesus is your shepherd and if you call upon him whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved he will save you he will heal you he will deliver you he will sanctify you he will prepare a place for you in heaven as you say jesus i give myself to you i give my heart to you my savior i'm not going to look for any other savior you are my shepherd i'm not going to look for any other shepherd you are my sanctifier i'm not going to look for any other sanctifier you are all in all for me and tonight the lord will answer your prayer you are in the kingdom you get deeper into the kingdom in jesus name you are the door coming you are the door coming he wants to save you he wants to turn around your life your life will never be the same again whosoever 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 shall call on the name of god tonight shall be saved i will call i will pray I'll make him my savior, my Lord, and my shepherd, everything to me. Rise up and tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord. He wants to do that for you now. And he wants to take away any sin of the world, any sin of sin, any sin of Satan, any sin of the devil. He wants to be your savior. He wants to be your sanctifier. He wants to be your shepherd. He wants to be everything for you. Blessing is waiting for you today. Why don't you rise up? Why don't you rise up? The Lord is waiting for you. The Lord is waiting for you. Don't be slow about it. Close your eyes and open your mouth and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, here am I today. Here am I today. Here am I today. I make you my Savior. I make you my Lord. I make you my Redeemer. I thank you because you died for me on the cross of Calvary. You are the final sacrifice. And you are the perfect sacrifice. You are the acceptable sacrifice. I accept that right now. I receive that right now. Lord, here am I. Cleanse me from all my sin and break the power of sin away from my life. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my Shepherd. You are my Sanctifier. And I pray, Lord, everything I need to get to heaven, you are provided. Do it for me right now. You will do it. Call upon the name of the Lord. You will answer your prayer.